Okay, here's the question for today. Do great powers have the right, maybe even the responsibility, to use their great power to impose order on their regions of the world? So this is the question. I'm going to get to U.S. relations with Latin America, U.S. relations in the Western Hemisphere during the 20th century, mostly during the period after World War II, but I want to start it out earlier. In the days of the Roman Empire, Rome imposed something that in those days, in Latin, the language of the Roman Empire, was called the Pax Romana, the Pax, P-A-X, Peace of Rome, the Roman Peace. And certainly in the eyes of the Romans, it was a good deal. What it meant was that Roman military forces required compelled unruly characters in the region around the Mediterranean Sea to behave. And sometimes it involved the harsh use of Roman military power, but it brought an end, or largely an end, for a long period of time to the kind of outlawry, the piracy, the banditry that had plagued the area. In fact, plagued much of the world during much of world history and, and brought peace to that area. And not only did it benefit the Romans, but it seems to have benefited most of the people who lived in the area. And so although they occasionally complained, they, as far as we can tell, liked and benefited from the Pax Romana. Okay, so that's about the first time in history where one gets this, this sense of a great power using its great power to impose order, to compel different people in this region to act peacefully. Now, one imagines that there's something in it for Rome. Of course there is. The Romans tax the region around there. So the, the imperial power, the Roman imperial power, has to have something in it for itself. It's not doing this out of the goodness of the Roman heart. But on the other hand, if it delivers the goods, if it provides peace, then everybody benefits. So, this is an argument that has long been made for imperialism. Whether it was the imperialism of Rome, or the imperialism of countries like Britain and France in North America at one time, in Africa, in Asia during the 19th and early 20th centuries. It's an argument that doesn't hold much water anymore. Now that we live in a time when good international behavior is commonly expected, but in times before this, there certainly were groups in the regions that the imperial power was imposed upon that lived under British rule, for example, in India and French rule in West Africa. There certainly were groups who liked the idea of having this external power there. I talked about it briefly earlier in describing the Spanish-American War of the 1890s. And the reason that there was a Spanish-American War was that there were groups in Cuba, where the war originated, groups in Cuba who still liked Spanish control. And they, they liked being connected to Spain. And they thought that having this, this external power there was a good deal. Anyway, so this gets us to, since I was talking about Spain in Cuba, it gets us to what some people called the Pax Americana, the Pax Americana. And it has applied, it's been applied, the term has been applied to the United States in various portions of the world at various times of the 20th century. But we'll start with Latin America. The United States did go to war against Spain in Cuba, also in the Philippines, in Puerto Rico, in 1898, and came out of this with colonial control, formal colonial control over the Philippines and Puerto Rico, but with something else over Cuba, something called a protectorate. Now, the reason the United States did not annex Cuba the way it annexed the Philippines was that some opponents of the war had said that the United States 
had said that the advocates of war, the American advocates of the war, were using the suffering of the Cuban people, were using this uh, smokescreen of generosity, of philanthropy, to hide their imperial designs. That the whole idea of going to aid the suffering Cuban people was to create a new colony for the United States in Cuba. And the advocates of war said, no, 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 that's not what we have in mind at all. Now, some of them actually did have that in mind. But when the opponents of the war called their bluff, they had to say, no, 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 we'll never make Cuba into a colony. And in fact, that became written into the war appropriations legislation, which meant that at the end of the war, the United States displaces Spain. Spain gets thrown out of Cuba. American troops are still there, and American troops are a little bit lo loath to leave. Well, the troops would have been happy to leave, but the U.S. administration of first William McKinley and then Theodore Roosevelt didn't, were in no hurry to pull the American troops out because there was a fear that, well, the good behavior that U.S. troops had imposed on Cuba might fall apart. And you know, the United States had spent a bunch of money, and American lives had been lost, clearing Cuba of Spanish control. As in the case of the Pax Romana, there's got to be something in it for the power imposing order. And what was in it for the United States, what came out of negotiations with the new Cuban government, was a protectorate. A protectorate is a term, it, has, it was a term that was in use at the time, been around for a while, that basically said that this country, now we're speaking of Cuba, is an independent country. It's independent, it's self-governing. But in its relations with other countries, it has to pay attention to the interests of the protector country, that is the United States. So the Cuban government agreed that it would not engage in foreign relations with other countries to the detriment of the United States. And the United States was the one that determined whether it would be detrimental to American interests or not. So basically, home rule at home but a large American control over what Cuba could do in foreign affairs. Now, in some ways, for the United States, this was the, the best of all worlds, compared, for example, to the Philippines. The United, the United States formally annexed the Philippines. You could do an experiment out of this, in, in, in fact. You could say that in the United States, the U.S. is a formal imperial colonial power. In the Philippines, the United States is a formal colonial power. In Cuba, it exercises informal power. Now, what it meant in the Philippines was that the United States was responsible for good governance within the Philippines. And if the government in the Philippines did not treat Filipinos well, if it was corrupt, if it didn't deliver the goods, people could point the finger blame at the United States. In Cuba, the United States did not govern domestically. It didn't tell the Cubans you know, how to, uh, where to uh, make the new streets, what, the buildings, how to collect the garbage. That was up to the Cuban people. And that might be good or bad, and nobody could directly point the finger of blame at the United States. But the United States reserved the right to prevent Cuba, for example, from forming um, an alliance with Germany. Germany was the rising and apparently threatening power at the time. So the U.S. had power without responsibility in Cuba. It had power plus responsibility in the Philippines. As it turned out, Americans got tired of the responsibility in the Philippines, and within relatively short order, the United States government began planning on America's exit from the Philippines, which happened in 1946. But the United States government had no intention of organizing its exit from Cuba. Now, why Cuba? Why was the United States so interested in Cuba? Uh, Cuba was close to the United States, but so was Mexico. And well, the United States was pretty interested in Mexico, too, at the time. Uh, in fact, the United States would intervene in the Mexican Revolution of the 1910s. So the reasons the United States, and I'll say more about Mexico in a moment, but the reason the United States was so interested in Cuba and in Mexico was, first of all, they were very close to the United States. Mexico shares a long border with the United States. Cuba is just 90 miles off of Florida. But there was another reason. And that other reason had to do with what Theodore Roosevelt considered to be his great contribution to world civilization and that was the construction of the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal began construction in the 19, early 1900s, and it was completed in 1914. And at the time it opened, it made it a whole lot easier and less expensive 
for ships to travel from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States and vice versa. The Panama Canal became essentially an artery of American commerce and also of American defense. American naval vessels could traverse the Panama Canal just as American merchant ships could go through the Panama Canal, Panama Canal making a several thousand mile shortcut instead of going all the way around South America. And so Americans looked on the Panama Canal, Amer American leaders looked on the Panama Canal as something like America's main street. And so they wanted to keep everybody potentially threatening away from America's main street. I mean, just like they wanted to keep Amer uh, foreigners off the Mississippi River. Well, the Panama Canal was something of a version of the Mississippi River. It happened to be located in a foreign country, but within the foreign country, Panama, it was in a zone called the Panama Canal Zone in which the United States exercised all of the aspects of sovereignty on a 99-year lease that would run out in the late 1990s. So this was the situation, and this was why more than anything, the United States was so interested in Mexico, Cuba, because they were sort of between the United States and the entrances to the Panama Canal. The United States was also interested in Central America. It was interested occasionally in some of the other islands of the Caribbean. But Americans were very much less interested in South America. And the farther away you got from Panama, if you got to the tip of South America, Argentina and Chile, Americans rarely paid much attention to what was going on there. So it was it was really sort of Central America, the Caribbean, the Panama Canal region that Americans were most interested in. And it was this region that prompted Theodore Roosevelt to declare something called the Roosevelt Corollary, the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine dated way back to the 1820s. And this was Roosevelt's addition to it. And the Monroe Doctrine had said the United States would exercise predominant power in the Western Hemisphere. So this is to the basic question. Should the great power of the region exercise, uh, uh, impose order on a region? Is it the right? Is it the responsibility? Or is it something that great powers simply arrogate to themselves with no justification? This is the question that I put to you. And I'm trying to demonstrate aspects of this with respect to US relations with Latin America. So uh, the Monroe Doctrine claims a special role for the United States in the Western Hemisphere. The Roosevelt corollary to it went beyond that, saying that the United States would have to sometimes act as a police power, that was Roosevelt's term, a police power if countries of the Western Hemisphere didn't act appropriately, if they acted in a way, for example, that tempted other great powers to intervene in the Americas. And it was something that made the United States seem like a bully to, my, to many Latin Americans, because who is this President of the United States saying that he can send American troops around Latin America to impose America's version of what passes for order. No Latin American countries embrace this idea. It would be humiliating. It would be uh, do grave damage to their self-respect. Nonetheless, well, I guess nonetheless, they were willing to put up with it. To some extent, they had to put up with it, but they might have objected more than they did because, well, there were times when it was useful to have the United States act as this guarantor of peace. In Venezuela, for example, a country on the northern coast of South America, when it got crosswise with the German government, the Germans were threatening to use military pressure to get the Venezuelans to pay their debts. And Roosevelt told the Germans to back off. And from the standpoint of the Venezuelans, at least many Venezuelans, it was sort of better to have the United States as the one calling the shots, then Germany is the one calling the shots. Uh, opinion was divided on this to, to some extent. There was, to some, among some, there was a feeling, well, Germany's far away and therefore it's not going to be much threat. The United States is closer. But on the other hand, there were groups within Venezuela, Venezuela, there were groups in every Latin American country who felt that the United States had a lot to offer to those countries. So anyway, so this was the situation. The Roosevelt Corollary became, by the 1920s, something of a liability in American diplomacy because the United States did, in fact, send troops to various countries around the region during the 1910s and 1920s. And it was just too much for the self-respect of the Latin American countries. So it was exchanged for something called the good neighbor policy. The good neighbor policy took the position, made, made the statement for the United States, the United States would no longer intervene militarily in the countries of, the, of Latin America. And the United States would treat the countries of Latin America as a good neighbor, as equals. Now, nobody was really, nobody was fooled that the United States was not gonna treat 
Costa Rica as an equal, but the United States would respect the sovereignty of Costa Rica and the other countries. And this was where things stood through the 1930s. There were some, there were some strains on this principle when, for example, the government of Mexico seized the holdings of American oil companies in Mexico. Mexico at the time was one of the world's largest producers of oil. And American investors, American corporations, had invested a lot of money in Mexico, digging wells and providing the infrastructure that could bring the oil from the wellhead to seaports where it was exported, where it was shipped out. And this became a sticking point with many Mexicans because at the time Mexico was a largely agrarian country and there were these external powers, these external corporations, these Yankees, who were, well, the way it looked, they were taking Mexico's oil and selling it for their own profit. And, and so they were. Now, the Mexican government was receiving a concession, a payment of this, but many of the people in Mexico didn't much trust the Mexican government. And it was tempting for the Mexican government to get in league with the foreign capitalists, the Americans, and line their own pockets to the detriment of the long-term interests of the people of Mexico. Well, in reaction to this, a government in Mexico in the late 1930s said, enough of this, we are going to take control of Mexico's oil. And Mexico's oil will now be pumped out by Mexico's own oil company. Now, this, not surprisingly, upset the American corporations who'd invested a lot of money in Mexico. But the U.S. government, operating on the good neighbor principle and on the broader principle that it's an aspect of the sovereignty of nations, that they control the resources of their nations, that within their borders they can say who can own what. So the U.S. government did not dispute the principle of expropriation. The U.S. government negotiated long and hard to see that the companies that had had their properties expropriated received compensation for this. And here the principle was very much like the principle in domestic politics of eminent domain. If you own a piece of property and the state government, the county government decides it wants to build a road across it, this happens to be the best route for building a new road, you might not want to sell. You might say, I like my property the way it is. But in the greater public interest, under the principle of eminent domain, the government can say, sorry, you have to sell. Now, for this to work, and according to legal principles, precedents, and traditions, you have to be paid a fair price for your property. They can't just seize it with no compensation. So the principle of expropriation was like that. And the, the dispute over the oil properties was eventually resolved. And so American relations with Latin America were sometimes a bit testy, um, but relatively calm. I say relatively calm. Did they serve the interests of all the people of Latin America? By no means. But this was partly because the governments of Latin America didn't particularly represent the interests of all the people of Latin America. And there were times when things got even testier than usual. I mentioned the oil issue in Mexico. In the early 1950s, a leftist government emerged in Guatemala. Now, by the 1950s, we get into the Cold War. And so we get an overlay of additional concern on the part of American leaders regarding what's happening in Latin America. And I'll add once again that the greatest concern had to do with the region of the Caribbean basin. So the countries, uh, the islands and the, the mainland countries that have sort of access, easy access to the routes to and from the Panama Canal. So th that had always been the case. Now in the Cold War, there's a concern that the Soviet Union might penetrate this region and establish a foothold. And if the Soviet Union had a foothold on one of the main routes to the Panama Canal, then if there came a moment of tension, if trouble developed, if a war broke out between the United States and the Soviet Union, if the Cold War got hot, then the Soviets might use a naval base, for example, in Cuba or in Nicaragua or someplace like that against the United States. Now, 
At this point, American leaders resurrected the original meaning and purpose of the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine is sort of a uh, equal for equal thing. It was a statement by the United States government under James Monroe in the 1820s that the United States would not meddle in the affairs of Europe. Now this wasn't a huge concession on the part of the United States because in the 1820s most Americans had no interest in meddling in the affairs of Europe. But America was growing and so it was, at least for the future, the United States will not meddle in the affairs of Europe. But meanwhile, Europe must not meddle in the affairs of the Americas. Now, I mentioned this earlier when I was talking about the Monroe Doctrine. This was not a doctrine, a principle, a program that the countries of Latin America were asked to sign on to. They were simply informed that this was American policy. But you'll notice it says, okay, Europe needs to stay out of the Western Hemisphere. And so when the Cold War comes up, American leaders cite the Monroe Doctrine as reason why the United States ought to pay particular attention to the emergence, let's say, of a communist movement, a leftist movement, in a place like Guatemala. Because if a communist government takes control in Guatemala, what's the communist government going to do? It presumably is going to look to the Soviet Union for help. And the Soviet Union might very well provide help, but the Soviet Union is going to ask for something in return. What might it ask for in return? It's going to ask for perhaps an alliance. Uh, military bases, naval bases, that sort of thing, exactly what the United States does not want to see in the Western Hemisphere. And the United States has to do this in a kind of unilateral way because it was a fundamental principle, it is a fundamental principle of international affairs, that sovereign countries can form any alliances they want. And in these alliances, they can ask for military help, they can ask for economic help, they can do whatever they want. They can allow foreign countries to have military bases. <laughs> the United States knew this principle very well because by the 1950s the United States had military bases in many countries around the world. And the Soviet Union didn't like it at all, but the United States would say, wait a minute, it's an aspect of sovereignty, it's a principle of international law that countries can form alliances and establish bases where they're invited in. So the United States did not want to see a leftist regime emerge in Guatemala which is what we're focusing on in the early 1950s, precisely because once the leftists got in control in Guatemala, then it would be very difficult to deny them the right to ask for Soviet help, which is the natural thing that they would do. So this is why the United States government under Dwight Eisenhower unleashed the CIA on the government of Guatemala to destabilize the government of Guatemala, to help topple the government of Guatemala, and oversee the installation of a military regime in Guatemala that was more favorably inclined to the United States. Now, it would be a mistake to say that the United States CIA did this all by itself. There were people in Guatemala who were as anti-communist as the Eisenhower administration, as anybody in the United States. And the generals, the, the ones who came into power, they were even more anti-communist than Eisenhower was. So it's not as though the United States had to make the Guatemalan people or certain groups in Guatemala do the bidding of the United States. The United States facilitated it. There were times when this didn't work. It did work in Guatemala. It did work from the perspective of the United States. The leftist regime was overthrown. The generals take over. And Guatemala, well, one consequence of Guatemala is a horribly bloody civil war that went on for decades. But Guatemala was no longer seen as a threat to invite the Soviet Union in. Instead, the threat shifted to Cuba. And Cuba witnessed an insurgency. An insurgency, well, interestingly enough, not unlike the insurgency of the 1890s. But where the 1890s insurgency had been against Spanish control, in the case of the 1950s, it was against Cuban control, but Cuban control in league with the United States. So during the, the period of the American protectorate, from uh, the early 1900s through the 1950s, the United States had let the Cubans do more or less what the Cubans wanted to do internally, but took care to make sure that no Cuban government got too close to a potential enemy of the United States. And the United States was watching very closely in the 1950s as the experience in Guatemala demonstrated. So the United States watched with grave concern, growing concern, 
as an insurrectionary movement led by, as it turned out, Fidel Castro, threatened the stability of the pro-American regime in Cuba. And American leaders watched, they approved when the Cuban government tried to suppress the insurgency, but American leaders got concerned when those efforts to suppress the insurgency didn't have any permanent success. And American leaders were alarmed, they were appalled when the, when the insurgency succeeded at the beginning of 1959. And so this insurrectionary movement led by Fidel Castro takes power. And one of the first things that they do is to declare that the old regime is out and the old dependence on the United States is out. Now, put yourself in the shoes of Fidel Castro. The United States has been supporting the regime that you worked hard to overthrow. And the United States has been providing economic aid and military aid. So you're not gonna be very favorably disposed toward the United States. And you're enough of a student of history to know that the United States has basically dominated Cuban life for more than half a century. So if you're serious about reform in Cuba, you're gonna look for help where you can find it. And of course, the place you're gonna look is to the principal competitor of the United States, the Soviet Union. And this was what worried the United States. Fidel Castro would later say that he had long been a communist. There's not much evidence in support of this. Castro's conversion to communism seems to have post-dated his arrival in power and his awareness of a need to find a foreign sponsor, especially after the Eisenhower administration, fearing that this new regime was beyond America's control, imposed economic sanctions on the Cuban government. Economic sanctions, I should add, some of which remain in place until today. So, the United States puts the squeeze on Castro, hoping to drive Castro from power. When that doesn't work, when Castro turns toward the Soviet Union, then the new American administration, the Kennedy administration, authorizes the so-called Bay of Pigs operation. The CIA is up to its hijinks once again. So the CIA had succeeded in overthrowing the regime in Guatemala. The CIA is turned loose against the Castro regime in Cuba. This time, this time it doesn't work at all. The story leaks, the, the, the fact that these soldiers are coming in leaks ahead of time. Castro's forces are waiting for them. They are killed or captured, and the Bay of Pigs operation fizzles horribly. It gravely embarrasses the Kennedy administration, and it gives rise to the Cuban Missile Crisis, of which I spoke in a recent lecture. So as of the early 1960s, after the world survives the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States is in a situation where there is this communist government in Cuba. And as part of the deal ending the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States had pledged that it would not invade Cuba. So there is this communist regime very close to American shores, more suspicious than ever of the United States and more dependent than ever on the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union doesn't have nuclear missiles there, but the Soviet Union does have bases there. And it's in a position where if a war should break out, it could cause serious damage to the United States. So this is the situation the United States faces in the 1960s in the region that is closest to American shores, the region that in some ways the United States government is most sensitive about. What happens next, we'll see in the next lecture.